this moment that we're in right now, it's a big moment. Every Mass. The beginning of the homily. The reason it's a big moment, kind of a high stakes moment, is because of what we hear from surveys from Catholics about what they use to determine the value of their experience at Mass. The homily, the quality of the homily, is just about always at the top of the list. People want a good homily. The other two things that Catholics and surveys always say that they want is good music and a welcoming spirit, a welcome vibe when you walk into the church. If you have those three things, the surveys show there's a good chance that people will, will like their parish, will want to fill the church. And if those things are lacking, there's a good chance the parish is going to struggle. Now, there's a part of us that kind of chafes at that. Is there a part of you that doesn't like hearing that? Is there a part of you that says, wait a minute, wait a minute, what, a, what about the Eucharist? For heaven's sakes, it doesn't matter. It, does, it almost doesn't matter if the homily's good or, or if the music is on key or if the microphone's working. It almost doesn't matter. As long as the Eucharist is there, you've got all that you need. And that's really true. That's really, that's a very important thing for us to keep in our hearts. But it's not the whole story. Because we know that there are plenty of churches where the Eucharist is just as present as it is here that are really struggling. That's one of the things that is talked about in the book Rebuilt, which is all about how we can make parish life thrive in today's culture. And there are pamphlets back there for you at the welcome desk to, to engage you on this topic of preaching at church and the role of preaching. And one of the big things in this book that is talked about is that we don't need to add anything to Mass. We're not lacking anything. There's no ingredient that's missing. We've got all that we need. We've got the scriptures, we've got the Eucharist, we've got the community, and we've got the priesthood. But it's a little bit like having a house that is wired for electricity. It's got all the power it needs, but we need to figure out how to get our, our plug into an outlet. If we have the most beautiful lamp in the world, but we don't have it plugged in, it's, it's not going to shine. So the job of the homily is to help people get their, their lamp plug into the outlet so that the power of these scriptures can surge into them and shine forth. I got to tell you that preaching is one of my very favorite parts of being a priest and also one of the hardest parts. It kind of feels sometimes like I'm going to have a term paper due every week for the rest of my life. <laughs> and one of the things that I thought I would like to do today is let you know a little bit of how I work on the homily every week. I thought you might find it interesting to know a little bit about the process and the decisions that go into making the homily as good as I possibly can make it. And the first element that I, I think is obvious to us, but maybe we don't think about very often, is that we don't get to choose the topic. We don't get to choose what the topic is. We don't get to choose the scriptures that we're gonna talk about today or the theme. I wanna talk about generosity. Can't talk about that. The, the, the day that we're in is Christ the King and the gospel we have to work with is the gospel of Matthew. I don't get to choose another gospel or another theme. I'm given the assignment. And this year we're hearing Matthew's view of Christ the King, which you just heard is a very specific view of Christ on the throne. But there's, there's going to be another Christ the King Sunday in a year, and it's going to be different readings. It's going to be John's gospel. And when you hear what John thinks about Christ being the King, it's completely different. And the year after that, we're going to hear about Luke's view. And again, another completely different twist on the same theme. But this year, we are working with this image of Christ on the throne, looking down at all the creatures. And the image we get is the sheep and the goats. And I was thinking, if I were one of the sheep or the goats, and I saw Christ on the throne, 
what would I expect would be happening next? And I thought, I would expect a quiz. I would expect that he would ask me a question, like a, like a competency exam, and I had to get the answer right. That's what I would assume would happen, you know? And, and when we hear this, it's, it's not true at all. I was picturing something like the confirmations of old, where the bishop could ask anyone any question he wanted and you had to have the answer. But, but no, it's, instead, it sounds a little more to me like the last episode of a reality show where all of a sudden we realize that Christ has been watching us the whole time. And we're like, really? And Christ is like, yeah. And I want to tell you what I've seen. And we're thinking, do I get a rose? <laughs> That's what it's more like. Maybe it's even more like the reality show Undercover Boss. Have any of you ever seen that show? For those of you who don't know it, it's, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a show where somebody new comes to work with you on your shift and you don't know that it's your boss's boss's boss. The person comes in and they're like, this is Joe. He's going to drive the garbage truck today. He's new. And you think, oh, hi, Joe. And then you find out at the end of the show, Joe owns this whole company and he's been watching you the whole time. It's a little bit more like that. So you see the challenge. That's the gospel that we've got to work with. It's filled with electricity. How do we plug in? How do we allow it to power the lamp that we are so we can shine the light? Well, one of the things I do to try to get us plugged in is I always write my homilies in public. Usually on Wednesday mornings, unless I have a funeral, I go into a coffee shop. This week it was Park and Elm at that little lunch counter there. I got a breakfast burrito and a coffee, and I sat there for three hours. And one of the reasons I do that and go to a coffee shop is so I can look at whoever's in line, whatever random person that is, probably not Catholic, and think to myself, would she care about this? What I'm writing about here, would this matter to her? Or would she say... That's what I'm trying to aim at. Does this have relevance to her story? That's what, that's what we hear is so important. I don't know if you've ever been to a homily that felt more like a history lesson. A lot of us have had that experience where you go to church and the priest is talking about this Greek word is translated like this and that, and it feels a bit like a history lesson. And they warn us in the seminary not to do that. They're like, you want to educate people, but it's not a class. Because if I started giving you a history lesson on all the different details of how this gospel was written and what the community, if I start going too deeply into that, you're going to think, but what does this have to do with the fact that my daughter was diagnosed this week with cancer? What does this have to do with me losing my job or the fact that my marriage is on the rocks? How is this going to help me with the fight I just had with my son or the estrangement I've got from this other person. We want the homily to educate us, but it's not a class. It's, it's got to help us grow more than it has to make us smarter. So that's when it gets a little tricky because I started doing research this week on facts about poverty because it's very clear that Christ is saying, I want you to be aware of the poor, the hungry, the thirsty. I want you to be aware of the stranger and the imprisoned. We, we just heard him say that. So I started looking up facts about Haiti because it's the poorest country in our hemisphere. I found out that in Haiti, the average family has six people and their average weekly salary is $27. $4.50 a week per person. 64 cents a day. So when I read that, I was looking for, for some news articles about hunger in Haiti. And one of the things that I read was that the people in Haiti have such terrible hunger pains that they make cookies out of mud just to, just to ease the pain of hunger. But the mud is not digestible. And so it gives them diarrhea, which makes them less nourished. It actually does the opposite of what it's meant to do, but they can't bear the hunger pains, so they have to do it. And I think to myself, should I tell the assembly that? 
is it helpful or is it, is it too much? Is it going to be distracting? Are they not going to be able to hear what I say next? So then I thought about poverty statistics from the United States and about the fact that 14 states have a poverty rate above 16%, which means more than one in six people in those states is poor. And then I heard that even though we're the richest country in the world, we only have four states in the whole country that have a poverty line below 10%. Only, four, only, only these four states, the richest states. So interestingly, what that meant was, one statistics I, I saw was California is the most populated state in the country. It's got 38 million people. But if we took all the people who were poor and moved them where they were to one state, it would become the biggest state with 46.5 million. And I think to myself, should I, should I tell them this? Is that turning this into a class? Is that helpful? Will that help people grow and want to do something? Or will it feel overwhelming? So as I sat with those facts, I went back to the idea of the undercover boss. Because it's very clear that that really fits what this gospel is trying to say. And I was thinking, what is Jesus looking for as he looks on the throne at the last episode of the reality show of our lives? What is he looking for? And I realized, basically, it's kind of like a teenager applying for college needs a letter of recommendation in order to get past the admissions counselor. So it, that's basically what this, le this is saying. We need a letter of recommendation from a poor person if we want to get into heaven. Jesus says, where's your letter of recommendation? Because these people were hungry. They were, they were thirsty. They were, they were in pain. And you knew about it. Did you feed them? You didn't know that I was one of them. I was the undercover boss. And I was watching. Do you have a letter of recommendation to give me? So I thought, well, what would it look like to have something to tell Jesus about? And I was looking at stories, and I was thinking I could talk about our food pantry. We have so many heartwarming stories from our food pantry. But I thought, this story from Toronto really got my attention. This guy was aware that catering organizations have to throw away so much food. Have you ever thought of how much food must go in the garbage after a wedding reception? Or after a cruise? or after a buffet at a conference, can you just imagine all that food in the garbage? And it's good food, but they can't serve it tomorrow, and the laws are for health. And so he came up with an idea called B1 to give. B1 to give. And so what it is, it, it was this idea to work with catering companies to take all of their leftovers and be able to deliver it to homeless shelters and to homes where people are hungry and be able to do it kind of like Uber Eats or Grubhub. And just in four years by doing that, he's rescued 25,000 pounds of food that was going to be thrown away. He's fed thousands of people. And it's all because of that idea. But then I look down at my timer here, and I'm way over on time. So I think I better wrap it up with a, a quote that I couldn't get out of my mind once I, once I heard it. So I think I'll end with this. Mother Teresa said something about the poor. She said, only once we get to heaven will we realize how much we owe the poor for helping us to love God better because of them. <laughs>